So we're going to start now with our discussion about key components in C++. So the purpose of these slides will be to give you an overview of C++. It's not really meant to be code-centric. There's a few little snippets of code here and there. We will start getting into the code-centric parts of this in later days in this week. Uh, what I want to do now is just give you an overview of C++, kind of walk through what problems it's trying to solve, a little bit about its history, and all this material will be uploaded together with the video and the slides later today. So let's start off by kind of talking about what the key components are in C++. So C++ is what we now call a multi-paradigm programming language, and I'll explain what it means to be multi-paradigm in a second. And the thing that really distinguishes C++ from other languages that are popular these days, like JavaScript or Java or Kotlin or C Sharp, is it tries to support powerful yet lightweight abstractions. So it's, it's a very powerful language, but it's also trying to keep the overhead down. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So when we talk about paradigms, that's just a fancy word for kind of groups of capabilities that fall under certain headings. There are three primary paradigms that are supported by C++. And I'm sure people would argue that there's more than three, but I like to kind of glom them into three. And you can read uh, more about this if you take a look at this presentation that Bjorn Strustrup, the inventor of C++, gave a number of years ago when he was at AT&T Labs in the research part. And he talks about multi-paradigm programming in standard C++. So the first paradigm is procedural programming. And uh, this is what C++ inherits from C. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Back when I was learning C++, back in the, the mid 80s, most people were C programmers. And so if you wanted to explain what C++ was, you explained it in terms of how it differed from C. Even though C remains an incredibly popular language, most people learning C++, especially in college, aren't really familiar with C when they learn C++. More likely, they're familiar with Java or perhaps Python. So this particular vintage or paradigm is, is not as important nowadays as it was 30 to 35 years ago when I was learning C++. And there's actually this interesting paper called C++, as close as possible to C but no closer. And you can get a kind of a weird preprint of, or, or weird reprint of this paper at the link at the bottom of the page here. It's got some scribbles on it. Um, and it'll tell you kind of the thinking back in the late 80s about what C++ was. And that's the first paradigm. Um, quite frankly, a lot of the weird quirks of C++ were inherited, using that word loosely, from C. So some of the things that make you scratch your, your chin and go, boy, that's really odd. It, chances are it's probably from C. The good news is that that part is now being kind of um, obsoleted and uh, de-emphasized. The second major paradigm that C++ supports, and really what made it famous back in the day, is its support for so-called object-oriented programming. And if you take a look at this book, which was the first edition of Bjorn Strusip's The C++ Programming Language book, that explains the object-oriented parts of C++. And, and these include all the things we've come to know and love in other object-oriented languages like Java or C Sharp or Python. It has classes, it has inheritance, it has dynamic binding, it has encapsulation, which kind of comes along for the ride from classes, I meaning you can hide the representational details. And, and this is, like I said, this is really where C++ got its start because back in those days, people were primarily programming in C, and so these abstractions were a big win. And I remember how excited it was when I learned C++ because I, I knew C a little bit and I knew it was really quirky and brittle and error prone. And C++ was just so much more convenient to work in. I could make fewer mistakes, be more expressive and so on. So that was kind of the 80s. And then in the 90s up to today, the real focus of C++ at a high level is what I would call generic programming. And this all comes by virtue of the template feature that was added to C++ in the very early 90s. And then by sort of the 93, 94 timeframe, some really clever people figured out how to build an, 
incredibly powerful set of class classes called the Standard Template Library. And from there on, it was all, all to the races to do all kinds of cool things based on this concept of generic programming. We'll talk a lot more about generic programming later, but basically generic programming allows you to abstract away from the types that containers and algorithms work on so that you can have generic code that'll work with many different types in a relatively convenient and consistent plug and play like manner. I'll be giving you more specific details about uh, generic programming here in just a bit, but that's in my mind the, the major paradigm of C++, and that's the one that's getting the most attention nowadays with enhancements to C++11 and C++14 and C++17 and C++20. You can see every, every three years or so they come up with new releases that have all kinds of cool stuff. So what's in the language? Well, built into the language are a couple of pieces. Uh, obviously, again, looking historically, there's the reliance on the C portions of C++. And these are what we might call loosely typed. You can do a lot of you know, somewhat questionable things by modern standards. And uh, back in those days, uh, people were you know, really wrestling with the fact that compilers were slow and memory was scarce and processors were slow. So wringing every last ounce of efficiency out of the runtime system was important. And C++ followed in that theme by trying to be efficient, but they added these other cool lightweight abstractions, things like classes, things like templates, things like operator overloading for, and upper overloading of functions or methods, references, Boolean exceptions, runtime type identification, namespaces, and so on and so forth. And obviously C++ has continued to evolve. And there's been a lot of really cool features added, which we'll be covering in great detail throughout the course. But this is kind of the, the core part of C++. And if you go to the link at the bottom of the page, you'll find relevant descriptions of many, many of the features that are in C++. The next thing C++ provides, and, and this is really where the bulk of the action is these days, is not so much in the language per se, there are little tweaks here and there in the language over time, but more it's moved into the library or the libraries. And the C++ uh, standard library consists of the C standard library, but mercifully very few people need to use that anymore because it's been overcome and improved by C++. And then what's in the C++ library? And this includes things like a very interesting input and output set of classes called IO streams, um, things like threads, you can now have threads, you can have various kinds of synchronizers, you can have, of course, a string, couldn't get by without a string. Um, and then there's a bunch of other classes that are not as widely used, like Valarray or complex numbers and so on. Um, but the, the big 800-pound gorilla in the C++ standard library is the standard template library. Now, what this diagram here shows is that there's some stuff that's in the standard library. So when you get a C++ compiler that's standards compliant, these things will come right out of the box. But of course, there's also a ton of other third-party libraries that do all kinds of other things. So graphical user interfaces, parallel computing, mobile processing, databases, serialization, security, you name it. There's all kinds of other stuff. And a lot of this is actually part of something called Boost, and we'll talk more about Boost later. Boost is kind of a, a proving ground for new ideas that will eventually find their way into the C++ standard library. The standard library is cool, but the really, really, really cool thing there is the standard template library, or STL. And we're going to spend a very focused amount of time in this course on STL, because if you really want to shine as a C++ program, you've got to have deep understanding of STL. And there are three primary abstractions in STL that are important to understand. One are containers, which are basically data structures, like uh, maps and sets and vectors and lists and so on. One is iterators, which allow you to access the elements in a container in a stylized and uniform way. Then we have algorithms, and algorithms are basically predefined functions that work on the elements of containers via their iterators. 
And then there's also some other things that are not quite as se- essential, things like function objects or functors, which are basically the, the strategy pattern from the Gang of Four books. So you can parameterize your algorithms or your containers with various classes or objects that will influence how they behave. There's other minor things like traits. There's uh, retrofitting of IO streams with various adapters to work with containers and iterators and algorithms. There's allocators to allocate memory if you don't like what comes off the standard C++ heap and so on and so forth. So this is where we're going to spend a lot of our time. And I really like STL. STL is so much fun. It's really the, the pinnacle of generic programming. And they've added so many cool things to it over time to make it incredibly powerful, but also very, very efficient. And we'll spend some time as we go through examples, probably starting tomorrow, seeing how efficient STL is. So those are the key components in, the, in C++. 